Okay, so uh, we are going like Uh, hi everybody, uh, welcome to this online session. Uh, uh, today we have uh, uh, an important educator, a uh, very creative educator actually, uh, uh, right from England. Uh, we have uh, Rachel Gotham. Uh, hi Rachel. Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm great. So uh, uh, maybe you can, uh, you know, uh, introduce a little bit uh, yourself to the uh, Moroccan audience, uh, audience uh, uh, to get to know a little uh, about your background, uh, uh, a little bit about uh, where you work, uh, maybe your academy, and uh, and then we can start uh, the question that we start uh, answering uh, the questions that we have received from our audience. Yeah, of course. So I'm originally from Australia. Uh, I taught as a classroom teacher there for two years and then I moved over to the UK where I took on a role as a computing lead uh, and it was very new to me. I didn't have a background in computing or IT. Uh, so I sort of had to build up my skill level and knowledge uh, and then sort of moved across into working as a trainer uh, and training educators around the world. Uh, and then sort of during the height of lockdown uh, in the UK, uh, I got a job at a primary multi-academy trust. Uh, so almost like a small district. So we're made up of six uh, early years and primary schools uh, where I lead on technology. Oh, sounds great. So you are originally from Australia? Yes, I am. <laughs> Good. Uh, so, uh, okay, so let's start uh, by uh, the academy. I know that you guys uh, have an online academy. It's Leo Academy Trust. So maybe one of the questions is, do you have guys like uh, partnerships outside the UK? Uh, uh, I mean partnerships with schools or with individuals or maybe with companies uh, or, or uh, you know from other uh, with other countries educational partnerships. Yeah, so we've got educational partnerships uh, with a school in China, um, and that's a very close sort of partnership that we have where our pupils get to communicate with. Uh, with the schools there uh, and it's usually sort of pre-COVID uh, also involved a trip out so where our pupils would, would do an exchange trip and they would actually get to go over uh, and experience what school was like there and, and equally then in the in the following year they would do the same exchange uh, back to back to Leo as well. Oh so you have uh partnerships with uh, with, uh, with China, you said. What about yes. Arab countries? Do you have any part partnerships with Arab countries? No, we don't. Okay. Do you plan to have partnerships with uh, any other Arab universities or institutions, maybe? So we're, uh, you know, we're a primary school. I guess if, you know, if there are uh, connections, we always, um, you know, love to have that opportunity for, for learners to actually connect and see what life is like and actually build up that aspect of how learning's done in different ways and also just to, you know, allow children to sort of um, ex expand their understanding and, and learning from other children as well around the world. Yes, it can be done through projects or uh, I, I'm not sure how you do it, but uh, it can be done through uh, online projects, for example, uh, through, uh, you know, learning management systems, uh, uh, you know, students can interact with each other, exchange, you know, uh, I don't know, exchange experiences, etc. Definitely. Uh, so your academy is, uh, so your academy is centered on primary education, right? Yes, it is, yeah. Uh, I, I also learned that you have uh, uh, 
mini academy is inside the academy. Yes, yeah, right? so we've so we've got six primary schools that fall into the academy. Okay, good. Okay, concerning professional development training uh, that you guys are doing on the academy. Uh, uh, are there uh, any uh, new uh, professional development training for teachers, for educators, uh, maybe MOOCs or courses uh, in methodology or in teaching English? Or... Yeah, so one of the um, projects that I've sort of set up and worked on is, is a site called Badge EdTech. Uh, and that's a place that educators around the world can go to to be able to learn about different EdTech applications, but also various different uh, certifications that are available for educators to upskill themselves um, and also just to earn those credentials as well. Yes, I saw a webinar about this uh, badge ethic. It's actually a great site. Uh, is it only for, uh, I thought at first it was uh, about creating digital budgets, but uh, I think there are other things in this site, right? Yeah, so it is, it's specifically around teacher CPD. Uh, so any educators that are looking to earn certifications uh, and even just to upskill themselves so that they understand more about various different ed tech applications, uh, the, those certifications and courses are a great way to be able to do that. And yeah. most of them are all free as well. So that's a big, big plus for educators around the world that, uh, the majority of those that are on there are free to complete. Uh, the only ones that some of them uh, do come with sort of a paid element are in the certifications area. Okay, you mean the paid element uh, concerning uh, to get a hard copy or something? Yeah, so for example, the Google Certified Educator um, Level 1 and 2 are both paid exams uh, to take. Yes, yes. So uh, uh, we have uh, a question about the, 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 uh, the, the, whether you have any kind of events or conferences you organize at your academy. Yes, yeah, so we maybe you plan to have. Yeah, we actually just had our annual conference on Monday, uh, just coming back after the half term, and it was all about staff and pupil well-being. Uh, that's been a big focus for us, um, you know, prior to this year, um, but actually what sort of came about during COVID was very much that pupil well-being is the centre of what we do, and, and we need to make sure that if we are in that position of delivering online learning, uh, that actually we do still keep our pupil well-being uh, at the forefront of the learning. Okay, how how you guys dealt with the, the COVID? Uh, have you uh, closed the school or moved the, the, the classes online? Or? Yeah, so during, uh, for, for London in the UK, we were closed from March. Uh, and that was sort of all of all of the children except our sort of key worker children that were still in um, and then sort of come towards June I think it was um, we then had our reception and year six children back in school uh, so that was sort of a big shift uh, coming back and then come uh, after the summer we've had everyone back in school uh, so it's, it is obviously sort of a, a challenging time, uh, but we're sort of, you know, we do have some children that are at home isolating um, and that's just due to health concerns. Uh, so it's just trying to keep, you know, keep that learning happening for those that are out of the classroom currently. Yes, and the issue that, that children are easily infected, it's not like uh, adults, uh, that's the problem. Uh, I have a comment here. What are the procedures that, that need to be taken by schools if uh, you want to have partnership with your academy? The legal procedures, uh, maybe the steps. 
Uh, steps to take, I, th I think it's very much sort of just being able to reach out and, and make contact initially, um, you know, with someone like myself uh, to sort of set up and see what that connection looks like and also just to sort of gain an understanding as to what the, the context is around trying to set up that partnership as well. Yes, the way as you mentioned, it. is it? Yes, so we need to state the objectives of the partnership, right? Yes, yeah, definitely. So, so people can uh, directly contact you. Yep, so they can find me on Twitter at Tech Miss C. Okay, yes. So they, they need to state the purpose of the, uh, the partnership and then uh, uh, the, the, are, the other steps, are there any other steps involved or maybe just the objective? We usually start, you know, when, when any schools are trying to, to reach out to us, we always sort of start with what are the objectives first uh, and then get to know a little bit about the, their own school that they're contacting us from uh, and then go from there. Okay, yes. It, it doesn't have to be public or private. It... No. So how can a school become a trust school? I have this uh, question. Yeah, so that's actually one that I'm actually not 100% sure on. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, being from Australia, we don't have trusts or, or districts um, like they do both here uh, and in the state. So it's not actually something that I'm quite familiar with in, in terms of how that goes about uh, happening. Okay. Uh, okay, good. So we have uh, another question about what's your favorite technological tool or learning management system that you like as a teacher or as an educator? What's your favorite one? I know that you, that you are working with a lot, but what's your favorite one? Yeah, so my favorite sort of um, pupil management uh, system would definitely be Google Classroom uh, for sort of key stage two uh, and beyond. And then for early years and key stage one, uh, I definitely would choose Seesaw every day. Uh, it's just a fantastic tool for early years. It's really user-friendly and super easy for both children and teachers to get on as well. Yes, Google Classroom. Yeah, and, and Google Classroom, it's just that one sort of go central place where we can store and manage all of our assignments um, and use it as our, our daily workflow for students to go on and access their learning. Um, but essentially, it is just that workflow solution for them to see the tasks that they need to complete. Okay, uh, so this uh, learning ma management system, uh, this question about learning management system uh, will lead us to talk about uh, safety, online safety. Yep. What, are the, what are the procedures that you, uh, you, that you think uh, children, uh, sorry, teachers should uh, uh, follow to guarantee safety, uh, especially if they, have, if they are teaching children? I think the biggest thing when it comes to online safety is really just trying to make sure that we go in with trying to educate children in a positive way of around online safety. There's a lot of sort of curriculum out there that will often look at the negatives about online access and, you know, using the internet and looks at very much, okay, don't do this, make sure you turn these things off. Whereas, you know, we don't do a lot of empowering our learners to understand the benefits of using the internet uh, and how they can do that safely. We know that children are accessing the internet at a younger age uh, and they're accessing content that is often far beyond uh, their sort of age range um, and they will be seeing that on a daily basis. And it's not something that we can just stop. So I think it is really important that actually we do address that uh, and, and go from a positive stance and, and try and empower children to use it appropriately, but also use it, you know, to continue to support their own learning. 
Uh, okay, maybe do you, do you respond to what, uh, responding to what you just said? Do you think maybe we should have a, a like a code maybe? Yeah, so having, you know, having some kind of system around the, the ways that you teach and respond to online safety um, and also sort of educating students to sort of think about what it is that they look out for when they are online as well. Yes, yes. The problem is that uh, uh, most of learners uh, or maybe uh, the majority of learners, uh, they, they are off task. When you have, for example, uh, an assignment for them, they are doing something else. They are not focusing on the assignment. Maybe they are watching a movie, they are listening to music, or the, the, and the teacher cannot uh, know for sure that they are doing the task. I think that with that, I think just to sort of jump in on that part, I, I think one of the things that we often see that happens there is that you know, I've, I've sort of looked at what's happened during lockdown and, and you see so many educators and, and adults even, not just educators, but adults in general that will be working from home and they will be listening to music, having movies on in, on in the background. And, you know, we are very good at multitasking <laughs> uh, and to sort of assume that our, our students won't do that either. Uh, I think what it comes down to is the content that we actually provide our learners. So if we're providing a meaningful and en engaging and exciting assignment that is relevant to them and it is meaningful, they are less likely to disengage and to go and watch a, a video on YouTube or Netflix uh, than if that task is, is really exciting. So you are saying this, that this is just is a common problem even for others, multitasking. Most definitely. Okay. So uh, uh, there is another idea related to this, uh, which is assessment, uh, uh, which is uh, really a hot topic, especially uh, uh, online assessment. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you think teachers uh, can maybe have a strategy or a plan or a technique I don't know, to make sure that uh, students are relying on themselves when it comes to assessment. They are not uh, copying uh, from Google or copying from uh, other places. Yeah. I think when it comes to assessment, it's really important for us as educators to think about what is the what is the purpose of assessing our children's learning. So we do have those sort of bigger you know, overall end of the year, big assessments that happen. Um, however, when we think about, say, a midterm test or a, a quick check-in to understand where they're at, I think sometimes we need to also think about the questions that we set within that assignment. And, you know, equally, is that a question that is a sort of closed-end question or is it a more open-ended um, question? And, and sometimes as well, it's also thinking about why do we, you know, why do we need to give them just a simple test? Could we ask them to present their learning and present what it is that they've understood in a more creative way so that it's not just, okay, complete a test to show me what it is that you've learned. Um, and I think when you when you speak about as well, sort of how we empower those learners to sort of take that own responsibility of their assessment, I think giving them um, things like rubrics and criteria uh, is definitely really helpful. Okay, maybe quizzes are not a good idea to assess students, right? There's definitely there's definitely times and a place for for using quizzes. Um, I think it is just a matter of trying to get that balance between okay, when do you use those quizzes? Is it sort of at the start, and then you know, so that your final assessment isn't always just a quiz at the end of a topic. Okay, maybe uh, yes, uh, uh, assessment. Uh differs from one school to another, from one teacher to another. Uh, some, some teachers like to use uh, informal ways of assessment like portfolios. Uh, yep. Yep. Uh, other people uh, use projects. What's your favorite one? 
I think any creative way, so giving giving students choice in the way that they present their final learning piece um, is actually quite a nice way. So getting really creative and, and giving students that power to create a movie or to create a site to show their learning uh, is actually you know, a lot more powerful and will will really show you what they've learned and what they understand than maybe five or 10 questions on a quiz. Okay, good. So let's say that I am an, uh, a teacher who is not using technology. What do you think the best model or plan that I should follow to integrate technology into my classroom practice in a, pro in a slow, uh, progressive way. I have zero knowledge in technology and, and I want to integrate technology into my classroom. What do you think the plan or the step that I should follow to, to do it successfully? I think the key is trying to is definitely to start slow whenever we whenever we think about the use of technology it is always with starting slowly. Um, I think it's very easy to sort of go out there and see that there are hundreds of different tools that you can use when it comes to technology. Um, however, thinking thinking small and starting small is actually um, quite key and, and getting, you know, your students on board and, and really having a good understanding of those tools, but also knowing that anyone that uses technology, it won't work first perfectly it won't work it won't work perfectly the first time uh and and being ready for that to happen um but also being creative thinking sort of outside the box and sometimes i think the hardest thing that teachers try and do is to look at old planning lessons and then think, okay, how could I use technology? How could I use, um, you know, Adobe Spark or how could I use Book Creator and, and get students to respond um, in work that's already been planned in a very traditional way? Sometimes it's going back to what are the specific objectives that I want my learners to understand and perhaps um, I'm not sure sort of over there what uh, national curriculum or specific curriculum you, you have to follow, but looking at those key objectives and then thinking, okay, how could I get my learners to think more creatively and share their understanding? Okay, so the first step, not to panic and start slow. Yes. <laughs> and to understand the context of your learners and needs, etc. Most definitely. Yes, you mentioned Adobe Spark. It's my favorite uh, video tool. Uh, do you like Adobe Spark? Yeah, so we, we do a lot with Adobe Spark. Um, and, you know, I think one of the great things is for, not just for primary learners, but obviously being in a primary school, that's what we love, uh, is just how quick and easy it is to put together a graphic, a poster, uh, put together a quick little site or put together a video as well. So having those three options that are all sort of inbuilt in that one tool uh, that are very easy for students to use uh, is just fantastic. Yes, it's actually amazing. You can create short videos, you can, as you said, uh, create posters, you can do anything. And for and for anyone that hasn't used Adobe Spark before, um, it's worth saying that the Adobe Creative Educator Level One and Two course are just fantastic places to start. Uh, not only just to sort of get a deeper understanding about why creativity and education is so important, um, but also the Level Two course goes into more depth about how we support learners in a distance learning platform as well. Yes, I know that you have completed the first one, right? Yes, I have. I'm, I've Congrats. yet to hit submit on level two. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. So uh, uh, I, I saw some of your uh, sessions with uh, Adobe. Uh, uh, you like Adobe a lot, you like Adobe Adobe tools. I think you uh, you use them in your classroom, right? Yes. Apart from yes. Adobe, apart from Adobe Spark. The Adobe tools. Sorry. 
Yes, I said apart from Adobe Spark, do you use other Adobe tools? So not in not in our primary school. Um, we tend to just keep with um, just with Spark for our students. Um, I've sort of had a bit of a play with Photoshop and Illustrator, um, but for our students, we tend to stick to um, Spark. It's just the you know. It's really easy to use with Google Classroom. Uh, it works great on Chromebooks as well. Um, so, and you know, for primary students, I, th I think it's the most uh, sort of quick and simple tool for teachers, especially those that might not be uh, as tech savvy as well. Okay, do you, do you think uh, there is a question here? Uh, do you think that technology is always the best answer uh, for our classroom issues, for our teaching? Yeah, that's uh, always, a, always a good question. Um, and I definitely think that technology has a time and a place. Uh, so it's always important to remember that, you know, not everything, um, you know, we should do on using technology. Um, I always say that if the technology is going to add value to the learning, then use technology. If it's not going to enhance the learning, just use pen and paper. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people think, okay, everything has to be done with tech these days. Uh, and it's, it's very easy to use technology for everything. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're having effective teaching and learning taking place as well. So just being mindful about why you're using that technology in the first place. Okay, and there is also the challenge that we are surrounded by so many tools, so many educational tools, and uh, we sometimes get confused which one of these tools uh, will be suitable for our learners, will be suitable for our school. Uh, and we uh, teachers also need training in these tools. Don't you think so? Yes, definitely. And I think as, as a school, as a district, um, it is really important to sort of hone in on the tools that you do use, whether they are paid or free tools. Um, but in a sense, trying to sort of keep to a select group of tools that you work on for a course of a year. You can always go in and refine that in the following year when perhaps new tools may have come out. Um, but equally spending that time to train up your staff, train up your teachers in how to use those. Uh, but also, you know, make sure that your students know how to use those as well. And equally for us as teachers, when we find a new tool, if we sort of uh, you know, teaching our students 101 different tools every day, it is very hard for them to sort of navigate and continue to actually demonstrate their learning if they're also having to sit there and learn a new piece of technology every day. So, Rachel, do you, do you, do you organise any training for teachers, maybe online or offline? Or yeah. Yeah, so we... As a trust, we regularly run trainings uh, that anyone can can attend. Um, you know, during lockdown, we ran a series of lots and lots of trainings uh, every day, and and they're all available on our Leo Academy Trust YouTube channel. So anyone that wants to to go back and watch those um, are free to do so. So we went through a lot of different ed tech tools, uh, and also looking at things like being able to, you know, get pupils to respond to tasks creatively. Okay, nice to hear that. Okay, so uh, going back to the implementation or the uh, implementation of technological tools into our classes, do you think there is a lesson plan, uh, maybe uh, that we should follow, lesson plan, technology lesson plan? Because I, I, I heard a lot about technology in Do you think they are effective? To use? What was that, sorry? Uh, do you think that we should use uh, technology lesson plans if we want to integrate technology into uh, our classrooms? Because I saw some of those uh, lesson plans in which you integrate uh, particular models of technology 
like the uh, the summer model, like uh, you know, uh, models like that sort. Yeah. So I think models like Sema uh, and TPAC um, are two yes. of the big ones that are out there. Uh, and I think for schools, they're quite an effective way to sort of look at how technology is being used. Um, but I think it's important to remember that both of those, those those models aren't just a sort of this is the right way to use technology um, and if we look at the same R model uh, for those that maybe haven't seen it before it is a four-step model and, and sometimes depending on how you look at it and the model and representations if you just google the same R model you'll see a range of different um, images and graphics that come up um, you know often we see it is either the coffee cup uh, the Starbucks different coffee drinks uh, and it goes through from substitution to augmentation uh, to um, modification and redefinition. And I think what can often happen is that teachers then sort of discredit and think that they always have to be at that redefinition phase of the same R model. And whilst that's great, um, you know, to always provide sort of out there really exciting and engaging lessons we also know that there is still a value for having tasks that are substituted because equally a substitution task can still add more value than doing it just simply by um, pen and paper and equally someone's um, you know within a school um, you know I was at a ISTE conference and while well, we were doing the training and even everyone in the room always had a different view on whether a task was substitution or not because it ultimately comes down to a teacher's justification. Um, I really like the TPAC model and the reason for that is that it not only pulls together the teaching content, uh, so the knowledge and content area, it also pulls together pedagogy and also technology. So it's that Venn diagram that comes together with those three key areas of teaching and learning, but also thinks that um, also includes that technology aspect. And I think it's important for teachers to sort of understand that whenever we're planning a lesson, there's always going to be someone that is stronger in terms of thinking about, okay, how do I structure the lesson? How do I group the students for a task? You have someone who has a stronger content, subject content knowledge, and you'll always have someone that's sort of maybe a little bit more creative, um, a little bit more tech savvy, uh, and also just can then pull those together to really create that enriched lesson. Okay, so the, the, you, you are saying that the TPAC, the TPAC model is uh, more effective than the summer model because so of all that, these areas. Yeah, I think in terms of um, planning for a lesson, the TPAC model is definitely a fantastic spot to start because you bring together those three components that are essential for effective teaching and learning. Um, I think the same R model is, is great to sort of look at and think about the use of technology within a class or within a lesson. Okay, so the, the, the three areas or maybe the four areas of the TPAC model are content, right? Pedagogy yes. and, uh, yep. and the methodology. Yep. Okay. I use it to, do, to, to, to work with the summer model, but I, I, I find it a little difficult, especially in the advanced stages. But the first stage, I am okay with the first stage, the substitution stage, the augmentation stage. But modification and redefinition, uh, uh, students, you know, get lost. They don't, uh, they don't uh, focus on the task because they yeah, require a lot of Oh, sorry. Yes. Because they require a lot of uh, technology use. And, uh... Yeah, and I think as well, like that modification and, and redefinition phase is, is very much thinking sort of, okay, how is it that I'm going to provide a meaningful use of technology that really gets students uh, to sort of make those bigger world connections uh, and really apply their thinking in different ways as well. 
So, uh, so uh, you are saying that uh, uh, maybe we should the chip back model uh, and uh, use it or integrate it uh, into our planning, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. I think it's something that teachers innately do anyway. You know, teachers will always bring together their subject content knowledge and their uh, pedagogy. So the, when we talk about pedagogy, we're talking about uh, do we get students to work in small groups? Do they work individually? Do we get them to do a think pair share where they, you know, or perhaps they do a jigsaw uh, t task where they'll break into a small group and they'll each have a number and then they'll go and pair up with another number uh, to share their understanding. But often the technology is, is so, sort uh, of a throw in at the end. <laughs> and what we want to so see is that the three of them come together. So what you are saying is that with technology it doesn't serve any particular purpose, doesn't have a, a value, uh, there is no use of using it, right? Most definitely. So it should have a value. Yeah, if it doesn't, if it's not going to add value to the lesson, then, you know, why are we using it? So a value, for example, an accomplishment or something? So I think when we talk about value of, of technology, we, we're looking at, you know, what is it, what is it enhancing? So if we were, for example, to take a simple written task that we might get them to do on a worksheet, what is the value of just, we could just equally scan that, scan that document or upload that document and, and give it to them uh, on an iPad or give it to them on a Chromebook and get them to work through it. But what is the value of that? What is the value of just simply getting them to mark it up? Um, so, you know, if it was that we were going to give them sort of the power to use built-in dictionaries and, and to use those translation tools. So if you have a lot of um, EAL learners, then actually it is really helpful to use tools like that where it can translate the information. So already that task suddenly becomes more accessible to them because it can be translated because they can quickly have that information um, read back to them in their native language as well. Yes. Okay, you mentioned small groups and uh, their work. Uh, I actually love those interruption patterns. Uh, do you think technology can help us uh, you know, use those uh, interruption patterns? Most definitely. And I think, you know, during during lockdown, um, I think we've we've definitely seen teachers sort of have to get creative in terms of how we allow those experiences to take place. Um, you know, using simple things like a sharing a collaborative Google slide um, or even a Jamboard uh, to, you know, really quick ways to get students to do a think pair share or to do a jigsaw task where they're able to work on the same presentation. Um, and even if it's just that they're using that to be able to share their thoughts and ideas, it's actually giving them that space to be able to communicate um, even if they aren't in the classroom. So I don't know what it's okay. like for you at the moment, whether your learners are all in school or at home. Yes, we are actually uh, in the school. Uh, I, I am actually using, uh, I am not using Google Classroom, I am using another platform which is called Edmodo. Yep. Yes, uh, I, I create groups and uh, uh, I use codes with my students. Uh, it's, it's, uh, Nice. It's a nice learning management system. I've, I've used it before um, as a small task. Um, so we were working on a small mini project um, in another school and, and actually using Edmodo was great for that purpose because we wanted them to have that channel to be able to communicate as well directly within uh, and set up those groups, as you say. So um, it is really helpful for that purpose. Yes, yes. And they, uh, they added something uh, great. There is the ability now to, uh, to use Zoom using, uh, using it. It's a great feature.
Okay, uh, uh, I would like, uh, that was an interesting discussion. Hmm. Are there any more questions? So, uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, we have some comments from Facebook. Okay, which technological tool do you recommend to use with young learners in first and second grade? Yeah, so we, uh, we're just sort of starting to get our, our new devices in uh, and we're actually going to be using Chrome tablets. So they essentially run the same Chrome OS on them, uh, but they are just in, in tablet form. Um, otherwise, we uh, tend to sort of look at a 360 um, Chromebook, which allows the Chromebook to be converted into both a tablet, uh, so it can be used both as a laptop and a tablet, uh, and it's touch screen as well. So any kind of touch screen device uh, for years one and two is really effective, just purely because, you know, what we often find is that they're still trying to learn all of the letters uh, and on a keyboard those letters look completely different to the letters that they learn in the classroom we often see, you know they're learning the capital letters so when they see the letters on the keyboard they are quite different for them so actually having that touch interface is really helpful for them uh, i'm sure you heard a lot about uh, differentiation instruction right Yes. Uh, so what's, what's, what's your advice about this? About this? Yeah, so when differentiating instruction for, for learners, I think the key thing to sort of keep in mind is sort of, uh, you know, focusing initially on, you know, understanding where your students are at um, and also thinking about what supports need to be in place to be able to differentiate. So we often see that within any class, um, there's usually three groups um, that we look at for differentiation. And whilst there may be sort of outliers that sort of are on the very low or very high end, um, you know, we will ultimately have those sort of three main groups of ability levels within a class. Um, and, you know, having those tasks uh, differentiated, but in a way that also can still allow them to access that content, because sometimes it can be those sort of middle children that we, we miss and sort of just sit in the back of the classroom and, and can go through the whole year. They, you know, they don't do anything beyond what we ask. Um, and actually challenging them to sort of go to that next level is, is really helpful. So differentiation, but also just setting those challenges for them as well. We're talking about box sitters. Yes. <laughs> Low achievers. Uh, 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 what do you think, what, what is the best way to use uh, badges, digital badges or actual badges to motivate students? Yeah, so uh, this year we've started to roll out a, a digital skills um, passport for our learners um, wow. and, and that's around sort of giving them that digital motivation of, of getting that badge um, once they've sort of worked out some key digital skills. So I noticed um, as I've been leading on computing that what I often found in, in a lot of schools is that because technology is often rolled out in our older year group. So we often see schools that will start to roll out technology in year four or five or six. And so by doing so, what often happens is that children will have come up from years one and two, um, not having learned how to turn their device on and off, how to mute their device, um, you know, how to use simple keyboard shortcuts, all of those kinds of things that, you know, we would hope the children would know, um, even though that we often say that children are digital natives and they, they are so familiar and they use technology every day, which they do, they are very much accessing it to play games or to watch YouTube or to scroll through content. So they're not using it for learning purposes. So what I wanted to do was to identify the key skills that we felt that they needed to know um, and then giving them that little motivation of having a badge that they could collect uh, to use that as a way to sort of 
motivate them to work through various different areas? Yes, uh, you mentioned passport. So is it some sort of badge or a collection of badges maybe? Yeah, so it's a collection of badges um, that they have. So there's a little passport and it's broken down with all of the different skills that they can earn. And then at the back, there's all of the um, little digital badges that they can get once they've completed it. So one, one badge leads to the other? Yes. 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 But sometimes uh, giving... Uh, there's a problem. There is motivation, but sometimes students get bored from uh, so so if, if if they get so many badges, they get uh, they, they, they 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 become valueless. Do you agree with that? I think you know it, it really depends on your learner. So you'll sort of know what works for them if you notice that. So for us, um, we know that our children love earning badges. Um, so for us, we know that that system is is fantastic. But you might find that in your school you have a different system that works really well. Um, and I think with any kind of system in place, whether that's sort of a, a, you know, a badge, whether it's a token system, whether it's a star, a marble chart, you know, you name them, there's every, every, every school has their own sort of systems in place. But I, we will always have those students that really seek out that motivation from that and other learners that are very much more in, intrinsically motivated. Um, so they don't seek out those badges. They don't seek out that. Um, but what they will seek out is the learning. Um, and I think that's the key thing to keep in mind that you have to balance that level of earning the badge, but also what is it that you're going to learn by doing those you know, badges in the same process. And I think that's where you can really target all learners because whether they want the badge or not, they all will want to learn or achieve the badge in, in any direction. So uh, the badge is just a tool, it's not an end in itself. Most definitely. Yes. So is there any uh, device or tool that can help us create badges easily and effectively? Yeah, so our, when I... Oh, our own badges, I mean. Uh, I mean yeah, our so... own badges. We can... I designed all of my badges just in Google Drawings, um, but you know you could equally design them in Adobe Spark as well. Um, so Adobe Spark is is great for so any kind of um, you know software that you can use to just very quickly design a simple shape that you want to use uh, and then just use some icons so we often see that with badges we're looking at using a icon rather than an image uh, and what's nice about adobe spark is that all of those icons are built in so you don't have to go and sort of search for for those um, when i created when i created our badges i used flat icon i really like their badges uh, that they have in there uh, so it's just really easy to be able to sort of take the icon that you want uh, and then add it into sort of a design aspect. So Google Drawing is, is uh, yep. uh, great. I, I have never tried Google Drawing. Uh, uh, Drawing it sounds a little bit difficult. It's one of those tools that is, you know, sort of very quiet in the background. Uh, not many people use it, but it is, it's super simple to use. Uh, and, you know, just a really easy way. You just go in, you know, start with a round, either a round circle for your badge. Uh, you can be a little bit more creative and go in with something like a hexagon uh, and then just start to layer up. So use your, use your different color palettes uh, and just layer shapes on top of each other to get that same effect that you're looking for. Yes. Okay. So uh, there's a question about what is TESOL? So in a similar way to Edmodo and Google Classroom, Seesaw is a platform that is a learning journey for learning journal, sorry, for, for students. Uh, so students are able to go on, they're able to share their learning um, and equally teachers can go in and assign activities for children to use. Um, it's very sort of touchscreen um, based. So children can go in, they can easily 
upload and take photos directly within. Uh, it also has a fantastic drawing canvas uh, directly included within it. So it means that um, for, you know, for years one and two and even early years, it means that they don't need to use another platform. So they don't need another EdTech app to be able to go and, you know, do some markup on a piece of work or to be able to draw an image, they can do it all within Seesaw. So that's one of the big benefits of it. Uh, I learned that there is a program, an ambassador program, right? Yes, there is. For teachers? Yeah, for, for teachers. Okay, so they start teachers. off with the Seesaw Pioneer. Um, so anyone that's new to Seesaw can go on and do that. And then you move into uh, being a Seesaw uh, Ambassador. And then after three years of being a Seesaw uh, Ambassador, then you can go on to being a Seesaw Certified Educator. And all of those are on Badger Tech as well. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Great. Thank you. Okay, what's, what's uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that some teachers, not all teachers, complain that technology is full of drawbacks, uh, we have uh, connectivity problems, we have this, we have, th we have that, okay? They, they, they blame the technology and uh, uh, they don't blame themselves, they just blame technology. What's your advice for the teachers? I think, you know, having, you know, having seen sort of when internet goes down and you have those problems, I think it is very hard to sort of maintain those, those problems. Um, you know, when internet goes down, but equally sort of, it is the fact of, you know, having those, having that good internet set up, having, you know, access to devices is, is definitely key. Um, so, and, you know, whether, you know, if you can provide internet access, that was one thing that as a trust we did during lockdown was to, to provide uh, both devices and Wi-Fi to, to children that didn't have access to that at home. Okay. So, uh, uh, a teacher who, uh, a primary teacher said that I have a new student this year in grade one, okay, and I haven't met them before. How can I start teaching them online for the first time? What are the most important things to focus on at the very start? I think if you've never met the children before, um, the most important thing beyond anything else is simply get to know the children. Um, ultimately, as a teacher, our connections and our relationships with our, our children are what they remember more than what we teach them. So I would spend, um, you know, if you if you can't get in person and see them, uh, that you start to do some sort of fun get to know you activities online, uh, spend that time sort of really developing that connection, get them to do some little videos where they explain who they are, uh, talk a little bit about themselves. Um, you know, as a teacher, you can model doing that as well. So do a video about yourself and share that with them uh, and then get the children to do that as well so that you can really understand a little bit about them. Okay, great. Uh, Rachel, I know that you are an innovative teacher. Uh, do you have any future projects, international projects? So at the moment, I'm, I'm still working on sort of continuing to grow my Google Innovator project, which is my Badger tech site. Um, so that's sort of my big focus uh, to work on. Um, and, you know, sort of beyond that, I think as a trust, uh, we're continuing to sort of coach our teachers in using technology for learning. So that's always going to sort of be my, my big project. And I think um, sort of, you know, just continuing to support educators around the world uh, to, you know, just think creatively and, and to, you know, use technology in a meaningful way. Okay, so you are focusing on it, it tech right now. Yes. Uh, so it tech, uh, as, as you have mentioned, it tech offers uh, uh, online courses for teachers and uh, 
for students, right? Yes. And there are digital and uh, you know uh, copies, uh, hard copy uh, certificate. Yes. Okay, good. That that was a lovely discussion. So, uh, uh, can you share like four tips? with teachers uh, around the world, uh, especially those uh, who, uh, in, in those areas who are uh, affected by the COVID. What are, uh, what, what, what tips you can share or advices or ideas or? I think, you know, start small, whatever you're, whatever you're trying to do, if you're, um, you know, still teaching online, then, you know, try and sort of, nail down what tools you're going to use with your learners um, and you know if you're delivering online lessons that you keep them short um, you know an hour lesson doesn't require one hour of a teacher talking to children um, so really break that content up um, you know spend that sort of first initial part doing your teacher import and then really get them on to being able to collaborate and, and demonstrate their learning. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we are in a time where everything is sort of unknown. Um, so I think now more than ever is a time to actually try something new, try something different, um, you know, try and think differently about the way that you teach. Um, if you have access to technology, then use that technology in a way that you never used before. Um, I, you know, as part of our CPD that we did on Monday, one of the big things that I took away from it was if this was your final year of teaching, what's one thing, um, you know, that you would, you would do differently. Um, and I think, you know, we can apply that to everything that we do. You know, if it was your final year, uh, you know, what would be everything that you'd want to try uh, and just try that now. Yes. So do you think teachers maybe should collaborate more online, exchange experiences and, you know, uh, maybe uh, successful stories, uh, uh, successful lessons? Do you think that will help in their CPD? Definitely. I think it's really important for teachers to network. Uh, and, you know, for me personally, I've had have made all of my connections and learned so much from educators on Twitter. Uh, and I think being able to establish uh, what's often known as a PLN, uh, so a professional learning network, and actually having that with educators from around the world, it's very easy to network and collaborate within our schools, but ultimately we only see one way of doing things. So being able to collaborate with educators from around the world uh, in a space like Twitter or other, other platforms as well, um, and, and really network so that you can actually, you know, reach out. A lot of educators are, you know, always willing to sort of have a message sent their way uh, and, you know, share ideas, ask questions, uh, because that's really where you'll start to learn as well. Yes. So do you have any final comments for uh, our Moroccan audience, teachers, uh, uh, students who are watching now? from different, uh, and also from different uh, places in the Arab world. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, you are in a sort of pivotal point and I know that, um, you know, in the Arab countries, you're, you know, very on board and using technology and, and often are quite forward thinking um, with that in education. So I think, you know, feel free to, to reach out, um, you know, I'm always happy to, you know, have people come and ask questions, um, you know, reach out to me on Twitter uh, at Tech Miss C. If you do have any questions or ideas, um, want suggestions on how to do things, uh, then feel free to reach out. Okay. Do you, do you speak some Arabic? I don't know. It's one place, <laughs> it's one place in the world that I would love to visit. Okay, so uh, it was on my it was on my list to do this year, but sadly not this year. Okay, so you speak only English and uh, French, right? Ah, uh, Spanish. Okay, Spanish. Good. Okay. 
so thank you so much. That was uh, really uh, an interesting, useful uh, session. Uh, we have learned a lot from your experience, uh, especially when it comes to uh, technology integration. And hopefully teachers will uh, apply some of the ideas uh, that, you, that you have mentioned and uh, benefit also from the uh, online courses that you are having on your website on uh, EDIC, right? EDIC. Badger Tech. Uh, Badger Tech and uh, on your academy also. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me on. Okay, thank you and uh, see you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.